welcome to our online service today. Thank you again for tuning in and watching with us. My name is David, I'm one of the pastors here at Reedy Creek Baptist Church. Before we dive into God's Word, would you please pray with me? Father God, we thank you that we've got this opportunity now to open up your word. I pray that you may speak into our hearts. Please be with all those that are watching now, Lord. And I just pray, Father God, that your gentle hand will be laid upon them, Lord. And just fill them afresh with your Holy Spirit, Lord. And help them to have a good pair of listening ears to help us to hear what you may be saying to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, last week we commenced our new 20-week series going through the book of Romans. Leading up to and including Easter, we are going straight to chapter 3, focusing on some of the key doctrines of the Christian faith and what they mean to us in light of the death of Jesus Christ. Would you please turn with me now in your Bibles to Romans chapter 3, starting at verse 23. And so for the next five weeks, we're going to be focusing on this passage. Please read with me. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Last week we looked at sacrifice and what Paul was referring to in that passage. We first looked at verse 23 that says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, because our God is holy, he can't be close to or even look at sin. So, after, first, after sin first entered the world, God sacrificed an animal from which he made clothing to cover not only Adam and Eve's nakedness, but also to cover their sin from God's sight. As humanity stepped deeper into sin, from Cain's murder of Abel through to the times of Noah where he was the only one to be found righteous, sacrifices of animals without blemish were sacrificed. Rebellion and sin require death. They were not to be taken lightly. For the Israelites to gain forgiveness, something had to die. The blood was to cover their sin. This was graphically portrayed in Exodus chapter 12 verses 1 to 28. The story of the Passover, God instructs the Hebrews to sacrifice a lamb for each family. They were to take the blood of the lamb and then cover their doorways. This was so that the death angel would pass over them and not harm that family. Then they would be set free. Even after the Hebrews were set free, they failed to live up to God's standards as set out in the law that he had given them. And therefore, God established a new set of sacrifices that would cover the people's sins. And these are all set out in Leviticus chapters 1 to 7. Sacrifices were a painful process. I mean, that was the point. Sin led to death. It was serious. To avoid their own destruction because of their sin, the Israelites had to offer something innocent to die in their place. In this case, an animal without blemish. And so it was against this background that Paul referred to sacrifices in Romans chapter 3, verse 25, in which he referred about Christ. And he said, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. People deserving of death, could only be redeemed by the blood of something great enough to cover all of humanity, and nothing could be that great but that of Jesus himself. When Jesus Christ came, he was the perfect sacrifice, without blemish. As the animals offered had to be pure, he was perfect, without sin. And as death was required, someone had to die. Jesus was butchered to death like a lamb 
that were slaughtered. Not only did the death of Jesus cover our sin, but it also cleansed us of all sin. God sacrificed His beloved Son for our forgiveness. Jesus sacrificed His own life so that we might live. Last week was sacrifice. And this week we are looking at the next word that Paul uses in this passage in Romans, which is atonement. It says again in verse 25, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. Like the other words that Paul uses in this chapter, atonement has a significant historical and spiritual significance. In the Jewish feast calendar, there are seven major feasts, perhaps the most significant and meaningful feast, which is still observed today by Jews across the world, is the Day of Atonement. Throughout the centuries, many rabbis have called this feast as the day. Information about it can be found in Leviticus chapter 16. It is a very significant day. The Day of Atonement is centered within the tabernacle. Last week I shared a little bit about the tabernacle. A tabernacle was a place of worship, but it was considered far more important than what we think of a church building today as a place of worship. The central part of the tabernacle was the Holy of Holies. Inside the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. An Ark is a place or thing that provides protection, such as Noah's Ark, which was a boat that provided protection for Noah, his family and the animals during that worldwide flood. The Ark of the Covenant was just a, a box that housed and protected the law given to Moses, such as the Ten Commandments. This box was made of wood, but it had pure gold overlaid inside and out. It was about um, four feet long and just over two foot wide. However, the cover of this ark is very significant. It was known as the Seat of Atonement, which became the earthly throne of God. This Seat of Atonement, also known as the Mercy Seat, was made of pure gold. On either side were two gold cherubims or angels with outstretched wings that faced each other. There, above the cover of the ark, between the two cherubim, God would come to dwell on his earthly throne. Now, on this annual day of atonement, people had gathered everywhere. In the days of Moses, it was, the th it was in the thousands. In the days of Jesus, the numbers were tens of thousands. It was no party, though. It was the annual day in the air where people's sins were atoned for. Many knew that sin was serious and therefore it needed to be dealt with. There was a lot of spiritual and physical preparation involved here. The high priest, who was to represent the people, had to go through an elaborate preparation for he was to be within metres of the Most High God. So after washing and cleansing, the high priest sacrificed a bull and a ram, which is a male sheep, this sacrifice was for his sins and the sins of his family. Even the priests had to be super clean physically and spiritually, ready for this incredible ceremony. After sacrificing the bull and ram, the high priest would then enter the most holy place. And there he would light the incense. The smoke of the incense would, would hide the mercy seat or else he would die according to Leviticus 16. Here the smoke would create a protective screen, keeping the high priest from seeing God, as had been the experience of Moses with the cloud covering on Mount Sinai. In the smoke-filled room, the high priest was to take some of the blood from the sin offering and sprinkle some of it onto the mercy seat seven times. Having made the sin offering in the most holy place for himself and his family, he then goes back outside with his people. Next, the high priest is to cast lots, according to Leviticus chapter 16, verse 8. And then it was to determine which of the two goats is to be sacrificed as the sin offering for the Lord and which was to become the scapegoat. I know which one I would 
rather be. After sacrificing the first goat as a sin offering for the people, the high priest took some of the blood of the goat into the most holy place and then sprinkled it over that mercy seat. And so the sacrifices for the sins of the high priest, his family, and for the whole group of people have been made. God had atoned the sins of the people for another year. God is full of mercy and full of grace. The Day of Atonement was and still is a most significant day in Israel's year. People's sins were atoned for another year. One of the most prominent scholars of our time, F. F. Bruce, has written that the word used for this seat of atonement is used a further 20 times in the Greek Old Testament and used again by Paul in our reading, Romans 3 verse 25, when he wrote sacrifice of atonement. Paul saw the connection here of the high priest sprinkling on, of the blood on the mercy, mercy seat to make atonement for God's people and turned away God's anger and their sins to that of Christ whose blood was shed on the cross atoned for us and turned away God's anger at our sins. The mercy seat became a place of reconciliation just as the cross became a symbol of reconciliation. In Christ's sacrificial death the demands of God for justice against a sinful humanity are fully met. Christ is our mercy seat. On Good Friday, I'm going to be looking at another teaching of the Christian church, and that is Jesus being our substitute. Our sin was transferred to Jesus. He was condemned instead of us. His death atoned for us. Jesus made amends between us and God. The Apostle John witnessed Jesus being sacrificed. And so he wrote this, He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. Paul wrote in Romans 3 that because of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we have been justified and redeemed. Two wonderful teachings of the church that affirm our new position in Christ. And over the next couple of weeks, both Robbie and Tony will be teaching on these profound truths. Just as the goat that was killed and its blood sprinkled on the seat of atonement foreshadowed the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, so too was the scapegoat. As I mentioned before, there were two goats on that Day of Atonement. One that was sacrifice and the other one that had another purpose. When the high priest had sprinkled the blood of the first goat on the seat of atonement, he was to go back outside and gather the goat that was selected as the scapegoat. He was to lay his hands on the goat's head while confessing all of the sins of the people for the past year. This is according to Leviticus chapter 16, verse 21. And this is the most, a most sacred, powerful moment when God is meeting with people and their communal guilt is placed upon the head of that goat. The mood would be sombre. A moment when for the next year their sins are being covered. Now, there was some tradition surrounding the goat and a red cord. You could only find it in a few sources. They would take a red cord, red being symbolic of blood, judgment, sin and punishment, and it would be placed over the head of the goat. Then the man appointed for the task would lead the goat out into the wilderness. The word for this scapegoat goat is Azazel. Azazel carries with it the idea of taken away. The Gentile appointed to for this task would Azazel. The Azazel goat would take it away. It is removed. It is no longer there. It was being removed. The goat is led into a wilderness carrying the people's sins never to be seen again. 
in the Gospels when Jesus was before Pilate. His own community said that he's guilty and must be killed. But what they did not realize was they were placing their guilt onto Jesus. Pilate then ordered Jesus to be flogged and the soldiers twisted together that crown of thorns and put it on the head of Jesus. If you were to wear a crown of thorns on your head and it punches your, your skin, you're going to get what color lines around your head? Red. We are told in John chapter 19, verse, uh, in John chapter 19, that they shouted. They shouted. What did they first shout? It wasn't crucify him, no. They first shouted tw twice. Take him away. Take him away. And then they shouted, crucify him. Can you see the connection here? The scapegoat, the Azazel, that had the sins of the people on its head and wearing that red cord was taken away. Jesus wearing the crown of thorns on his head with the red blood pouring down around his head was taken away. As the goat carried away the sins of the people, so Jesus took away our sins. As the goat, full of sin, was taken away, never to be seen again, so King David, who thought of the Messiah, that he has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Day of Atonement was, in, was incredibly significant and important. It was also the foreshadow of the greater sacrifice of atonement to come, Jesus, God's Son our Saviour. There is an interesting passage in Revelation where the Apostle John is given a glimpse of heaven. It is found in chapters 4 and 5. And John saw an incredible sight that was hard to describe. But what he saw was this. He saw a throne and someone sitting on that throne. And they were like Jasper and Ruby and around the throne was a rainbow. Also around the throne were 24 elders. Who they are we, we don't really know. But also around the throne were four living creatures that had wings. Scholars often associate these living winged creatures as cherubim like those on the Ark of the Covenant on either side of the mercy seat. Again. In those last days, God the Father and God the Son will be surrounded by angelic beings singing over and over, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. The one who was slain, whose blood was poured out, is now worshipped as the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. Ah, oh, that day. That day of atonement was incredibly significant. But we could also see that that day of atonement played out in what Jesus did on the cross for us. Our sins were atoned for. And in the future, we look forward to that day when all these thousands and thousands Thousands, we are told, of angels around the throne singing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Oh, what a glorious day. Oh, we serve a majestic God. God who is full of grace and mercy, who has forgiven us on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us, for atoning for our sins. May God give you greater understanding in what he wants us to learn about the significance of the cross of Jesus. Would you please pray with me? Father God, we give you thanks for the atoning work of Jesus Christ. For he was sacrificed in our place for our forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus. As we head towards Easter, will you please prepare us spiritually and emotionally ready for this most significant time in the Christian church's calendar. Lord, 
you hate sin. You can't even look at it, and yet we are sinners. But through the sacrifice of atonement of the blood of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Reconciliation has occurred. Thank you that you love us so much. So help us, Lord, to love you with all of our heart, soul and mind. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.